in the 13th century according to oral tradition in the dense Congo River Basin. Here, a leader by the name of Lukeni Luanimi and his warriors crossed southward over the Congo River in today's Angola. They brought ideas of kingship from their history and grafted their rule onto the Ambundu people, who already had their own monarchy. The rulers that followed Lukeni all claimed some form of relation to his Kanda and were known as the Kilukeni or Mwene Congo, which means Lord or the ruler of the Congo Kingdom. The Kilukeni Kanda, House of Lukeni, would rule Congo unopposed for dynasties. In time, the Kingdom of Congo emerged as a sophisticated political system. At its peak, it comprised many governed provinces under local kings loyal to the overarching King of Congo, located at the mouth of the Congo River. This paramount ruler commanded immense power over the Congo lands and peoples beyond the kingdom's borders were widespread spheres of influence covering numerous vassal states. Now around this time in Europe, by the mid-15th century, the Byzantine Empire had collapsed and the various crusades that had taken place in the region had largely disrupted the overland routes of the Silk Road and trade. And with the rise of the Ottoman Empire in place of the Byzantines, Western Europe was cut from the Far East and also the outbreak of the Black Death in Europe. Advances in shipbuilding originating from China allowed vessels to sail longer distances from the coast. Sternpost rudders and multiple masts made ships more maneuverable. By the 1400s, ships grew bigger, able to cross oceans with fewer crew. With these new ships, Portugal explored down the African coast, seeking alternate routes around the Ottoman and Muslim-controlled land routes. Bartholomew Diaz rounded Africa's Cape of Good Hope in 1488, opening the first sea passage from Europe to Asia. Back in Congo, in 1480-82, Diogo Cão sailed far up the Congo River. After noticing discolored waters at its wide mouth of the Congo River, he met a great kingdom described as powerful, full of people, having many vassals. The Congo rulers were keen to trade with the newcomers. For many decades, the relationship was productive, with the Portuguese establishing their port at Luanda, it's crucial to understand that the Portuguese's initial ports were not meant to be settlements, but rather refreshment stations, as the journey from Portugal to the Far East was long and exhausting. So the Portuguese at first did not have intentions to settle in the Congo. However, it was later on as missionaries arrived and the journeys became more frequent, settlements began to spring up. And even as they settled, the kingdom was still very organized and powerful for the Portuguese to conquer by force, and it would take centuries for this to happen. After this first brief visit, Diogo Count would return soon after, with gifts and priests establishing ties with Congo. Diogo Count brought Congolese nobles back to Portugal to learn Portuguese and serve as interpreters. By Diego Keo's second Congolese voyage, the stage was set to introduce Christianity to Congo royalty. The kingdom's history was preserved through oral stories and traditions. We know it is very well recorded that King Nzinga converted in 1491 along with six courtiers, taking the Christian name Juantafu. A lavish baptismal ceremony followed, encouraging Catholicism in Congo as the national religion. As conversions were purely politically motivated, seeking a Portuguese alliance through adopting Christianity. It is important to understand that the king's conversion little to do with spirituality or forced conversion, but were more politically motivated. Furthermore, elements of Christianity such as life after death and the reverence of saints, which in Congolese terms meant the reverence to their ancestors, and also how highly spiritual the Congolese people were, and the belief in the unseen affecting the physical. So for them, adding another ally, Jesus and other saints, from the metaphysical world would offer more protection. Hence, most people didn't have issues accepting Catholicism because in addition to political alliance, it was also a status symbol. King Juan the Frey ruled until 1509, succeeded by his son, Mvemba Nzinga, known as Afonso I. A keen Christian supporter, Afonso Y worked to adapt Catholicism to Congo's needs, even lobbying the Vatican to relax priestly celibacy rules. Yet Afonso helped establish a unique Congolese Christianity that sustained his kingdom amidst outside pressures. Now, it was during this period that the kings began to lose power 
due to more and more pressure from the Portuguese as their influence was more prominent in the land. With this influence, which the Portuguese did not have in the previous century, they were now in a position to directly interfere in the political affairs of the kingdom, which they weren't able to do previously. And they began by abolishing the Congolese version of Christianity. It was during Afonso Fraga's reign that the rise of Brazil's slave trade began. This brutal new commerce frayed Congo's social fabric, sowing instability for centuries. When the pressure of slave hit the kingdom, initially Congo's kings regulated the slave trade according to Congolese law, but Portuguese traders illegally captured more slaves than permitted, bribing local chiefs. This caused Congo's ties with Portugal to fray, King Afonso. I wrote sternly to Portugal's king, demanding an end to the unlawful slave taking. Afonso appointed a committee to oversee the trade, but illicit slaving continued. When Afonso died, his son Mvemba Nzinga became King Kanga Vemba, but violent court factions toppled and murdered Kanga Vemba after just two years. His nephew, King Kumbia Mpuri, took the throne. Like his uncle, Kumbia Mpuri sought to control Portugal's slaving depredations. He regulated quotas and restricted trade licenses. Yet Portuguese slavers on Sao Tome Island flouted Congo's authority, illegally shipping thousands into bondage. Frustrated, Cumbia and Puri severed all ties with Portugal in 1526, expelling Portuguese from his kingdom. This pattern repeated under subsequent kings, struggling to limit Portugal's influence as Congo weakened. In 1665, King Antonio Thruvita and Kanga was assassinated, sparking four bloody civil wars that engulfed Congo. Conflicts with neighbors and Dutch invaders further splintered the kingdom. After Congo's defeat alongside the Dutch against Portugal at the Battle of Mbuila in 1665, 40 years of civil war sealed the kingdom's fate. Congo's alliance with Portugal and reliance on the slave trade eroded royal authority and tore the social fabric. By the 1700s, the once mighty kingdom was fatally fragmented, vulnerable to encroaching European powers and would never recover from this until it was broken apart by the Europeans at the Berlin Conference. The tragic decline of Congo reinforces how the insidious slave trade devastated African societies. Yet Congo's proud history and the kingdom's glories and trials illustrate a pivotal time in African history. Join me next time as we uncover more fascinating stories from the past. Until then, farewell from simple Africa.